Awesome. Well, first of all, thanks everyone for joining and for Flutter Warsaw for uh, inviting me and hosting me. It's always a pleasure. And um, yeah, as, as you mentioned, we'll be talking about some advanced topics today uh, for Qubit, but not just for Qubit, they will also apply for Block as well. And hopefully uh, these topics will be things that you might not have heard of or seen examples of, and uh, you'll leave having learned something new, hopefully today. And for everyone who doesn't know, I'm Felix. Um, I'm a software engineer at Very Good Ventures. Uh, Very Good Ventures, really quickly, is just a Flutter consultancy where we help teams basically get a competitive advantage using Flutter. So if you're interested to learn more about Very Good Ventures, you can check us out um, at the website. And just a high level agenda of uh, some of the topics that I'll try to cover today. Um, first one, and arguably the most important one, is testing. And uh, I will try to go over basically some common, um, try to address some common issues that I often see with code that isn't necessarily the most testable when using block and um, a structure that I recommend that works pretty well and is very simple. Um, then we'll move on to caching using hydrated block and take a look, a look at how that works and some sample apps and uh, follow that up with a newer package that maybe you haven't heard of called replay block, which shout out to Rody, Rody Davis. He uh, helped basically uh, create that from scratch. And so we'll take a look at how you can get some undo redo functionality for free uh, in your application if you're using block and qubit already. So without further ado, let's uh, jump into the testing. So um, if you don't know, there's a block test package already, which I will be using in these snippets. So I highly recommend checking it out if you're using the block library and you want to start using, uh, and you want to start writing uh, unit tests for your blocks or qubits. Um, definitely, yeah, check that out on pub.dev. I won't talk too much about the basics because this is an advanced talk, um, but there's some pretty good resources, which I'll link to at the end if you want more um, intro level material or content about block test. So, Let's jump into kind of like what's the high level goal or like what's something that like you might want to accomplish when you're writing tests and uh, taking a step back. Let's assume in the context of this talk, we're going to be building some sort of like weather application and we're going to have some simple functionality where we can fetch weather for a given city. Let's say Warsaw and we want to have this qubit or weather qubit here uh, that returns the weather in Warsaw. So let's say it's 10.3 degrees and let's say it's cloudy, right? How can we basically get here? And what is maybe wrong with this code? What are some problems that you might run into? Um, and yeah, what are maybe some questions? Some of you might be looking at this and already have some questions about this. I already have some questions. For example, how do we know that the temperature is 10.3 degrees in Warsaw and that it's cloudy? And how about if I run this test tomorrow, will the temperature still be 10.3 degrees and cloudy? And how can I uh, make sure that my tests are reliable and test my qubits and blocks so that I know that I have the confidence that they're doing what they're supposed to be doing, right? So some high level questions to answer when we're writing tests are, how can we control the state of our blocks or qubits um, in these tests so that we can make sure that our tests are consistent and comprehensive, right? How can we test all the edge cases, the no network scenario, timeouts, et cetera? All of these things are um, kind of important when you're writing tests because you wanna make sure that your tests don't just work for the sunny day scenario, but they also work when things maybe don't go as expected. Um, and so to answer some of these questions, um, there's a couple of things we can do that are pretty simple and you might've seen already examples of in other projects or in your own. Um, the first one and probably the most important one is having the separation. Having a layered architecture with strict boundaries is probably the most important thing in my opinion when writing testable code. And you'll see this concept of repositories and you'll see this concept of blocks and qubits, but it doesn't really matter. Uh, at the end of the day, the important thing is that you're separating um, each of your layers and have a single responsibility for those components. So basically the qubit in this case, the weather qubit, doesn't know where the weather data is coming from, doesn't know if it's coming from an API or a database or whatever the case might be. All it, do all it knows is I can ask this weather repository thing for some weather, give it the city, obviously, and then I can, uh, the qubit itself can internally basically handle that response and then convert that into states that the UI will render, right? And the repository does the rest. The repository might be working with some API, it might be working with the database, doesn't really matter for this case, but having that clear separation is step number one to being able to easily test your code. Um, the second step, uh, or a second thing that you probably will wanna do is be able to use some sort of mocking framework. The most popular one is Mockito. And you can basically be able to inject mock instances of this repository, for example. It works in any case, though. 
And that will allow you to basically stub not only exceptions, but you can also stub the, the happy day responses. You can um, fake timeouts. You can do all sorts of things to basically really push the component that you're testing to its limits and make sure that you're confident that the code you wrote behaves as you expect. Um, and I can't tell you enough how many times I've written code, written the tests right afterwards, and then been like, hmm, how about in this scenario? Let me quickly write a test for this scenario and my code will have failed that test. And so I'll be catching bugs basically as I'm writing tests uh, in code that I just wrote maybe like 30 seconds or a minute ago. So tests are there to be your friend, to help you basically give you that confidence that your code does what you think it's uh, supposed to do and what you want it to do. And also to reassure you over time that as more and more changes are made to the code base that your app will still continue to function and provide the best user experience possible. So let's take a look at what this weather qubit might look like. Right, so we, we saw that there's a glimpse of this fetch weather earlier. Um, what it might look like is something very simple like this, where it's just a function that takes a city and it might emit this loading state immediately so that you can have the user see some sort of um, spinner or some other sort of indicator to know that, hey, something is actually happening. And then we might have some sort of um, request to this repository to actually get the weather. And if that succeeds, we can emit a success. If that fails, we can emit a failure, right? Pretty standard. I'm sure a lot of you, if you've used Qubit or Block or looked at any of Rizzo Coder's tutorials, you've seen this code probably. And so that part's not really that interesting. Actually, the part that's interesting is these three dots here. And I want you to take a moment and just think about if this was your code, what would you put in that three dot placeholder there? How would you actually get this weather repository into the weather Qubit? So, there are many ways you can do it. Um, I'm sure that like the way I show you might not be the way you do it. And that doesn't mean that it's wrong. There are actually many ways that you can do this successfully, but I'll start off with what is I call the easy way. And so the easy way looks a little something like this, right? You have your constructor where you initialize the uh, initial state of the qubit. And then we can just define inline an instance of the weather repository, right? So this is the easy way, right? There's very little code here. like. There's not much complexity. We're just creating the instance of the repository on demand internally. And you might think like, hey, that's, that's simple, right? Simple is usually pretty good when developing. But I would say that there is a better way. And the better way is to actually inject the repository into the qubit. And what that does is it gives you a clear separation between what the qubit is doing and the thing that it's depending on, right? So now we can inject a mock repository. We can inject different types of this weather repository into the qubit and we have control over that dependency. Whereas before it was an internal dependency that once you create the weather qubit, you have zero control over what repository it's using or where it's getting its data. Um, yeah, so like basically you kind of lose control with the previous approach. While it's very simple, and this code is still very simple, right? Like it's just the constructor is um, taking in this extra weather repository, but it makes a huge difference when it comes to testability because now you have control as a developer um, for what goes into that qubit when you're instantiating it. And so if we take it from the top, um, you might be wondering like, okay, that's great, Felix, but like, I don't wanna be passing this weather repository instance all over my widget tree. I might have like 100 levels deep of widgets and like passing that through the constructor is gonna be a huge pain and I just don't wanna deal with that headache. So uh, let's take a look at how that might actually look uh, in kind of a maintainable way that's not gonna cause everyone to go crazy and pass the same instance all over the place. And so if we, if we look at the very top of the application, just your main function that every Flutter app has where we call run app, um, we're gonna create this instance of the weather app, which is gonna be the widget that has the material app, et cetera, that everyone's probably used to. And the only difference is the weather app will explicitly require that weather repository as a dependency. And that's important because it ensures that there's a single instance of this repository for the entire weather app application. And it also makes sure that the weather application it's strictly dependent on it, right? There's no like magic or like inference or anything happening here. The weather app strictly needs a weather repository to run. And you can write an assertion to make sure that happens. You can make this a non-optional parameter and just be as strict as possible that, hey, every time you make a weather app in Flutter, you need to give it a repository. Now, if we look at the next layer, inside that weather app, we can use this repository provider widget from the Flutter block package. You can also just use a regular vanilla provider as well, or you can write your own inherited widget. It doesn't really matter. But uh, the important thing is that we can take advantage of the inherited widget that's built into the Flutter framework to make this instance of the weather repository available to the entire subtree. So now anywhere within our material app, 
we have access to the weather repository instance. And that solves that problem of like, oh, I don't want to be passing this instance uh, five or six levels deep. And it might not even be used in any of those intermediate levels just because I need it like all the way in some leaf node in the widget tree. So by taking advantage of uh, inherited widget and using either provider or repository provider or whatever your preferred um, approach is, you can make that instance available to your material app. And then uh, if there are many, which typically most apps will have probably more than one domain. And so you might want to have like a user uh, domain, a weather domain, some authentication, maybe something else. So in those cases, uh, there are these multi uh, repository provider widget or there's the multi provider widget from the provider package. You can also write your own as well. Um, and we can solve that problem of providing multiple and still preventing the code from becoming super nested and uh, keep it easy to read while still providing those dependencies to the entire application. So now let's just say like, okay, somewhere in the material app further down in the widget tree, we have our home page, right? Home page is just a stateless widget and it's going to render this home view child. So this is an important uh, kind of pattern or thing that I like to do, which is separate the widget that is providing the dependencies from the widget that is consuming the dependencies. So in this case, the home page's only job is to provide the home view with the weather qubit. And it has nothing with UI, no rendering of, of any widgets, no logic, nothing. It's, its only goal is to basically make sure that when this home view is rendered, there is a weather qubit available. And the way that it does that is by using the block provider widget from the Flutter block package. And we can create the weather qubit within the create callback. This will handle automatically disposing it when it gets unmounted from the widget tree. And then the dependency, right, it needs a weather repository and we can access that weather repository using the extension on build context. So you can do context.repository and pass the type. And so from anywhere in the widget tree, you could do context.repository, weather repository, as long as you have a build context, obviously. And um, in this case, we're just using it so that we can create this instance of the qubit so that the home view can use it. And now the home view might just look something like, okay, I have a block builder. I can basically handle the different states and build different UI. So I might have like an empty widget, a loading widget, a populated widget, and an error widget, right? Nothing crazy. But the important thing is this widget has nothing to do with creating the weather qubit. It is just consuming the weather qubit. And so having, again, that separation makes this very, very easy to test. So let's take a look at how we might test this. Um, first, let's start with testing the qubit, and then we'll test the widget as well. So you can get a sense of both sides. We're not just going to do unit tests. We'll also look at some widget tests. So when we're doing the unit tests, um, there's basically gonna be like some similar steps that you'll do no matter what test you're running. So the first thing I like to do is I think about, okay, what am I testing? So in this case, I'm testing the weather qubit. Um, I like to create a top level group for the thing that I'm testing uh, just for organizational purposes and also it makes the test read nicely. And then the next thing I think about is, okay, if I'm gonna create a weather qubit, what does it need? And in this case, the only dependency it has is on the weather repository. Um, and so the weather repository, we said we don't want to use a real one, right? Because it's unreliable. It makes network requests um, potentially to the back end, et cetera. So we are going to use the Mockito library to basically define a mock weather repository by extending the mock class from Mockito and still implementing that interface from the weather repository. So at the end of the day, you have a mock weather repository, which is a weather repository. And in the setup um, of our test, which gets called before every single test is executed, we can create a fresh new mock weather repository and then pass that mock into the weather qubit. And similarly, when we um, finish each test, we'll run this teardown, which will free any resources that are maintained within the qubit itself. So that's just a good thing to add. And uh, now we can basically get to the interesting part, which is stubbing the repository. So because the repository is a mock weather repository, we can now use the when API. And anytime anyone calls the get weather um, method on the weather repository, regardless of what arguments are passed in using this any matcher, we can answer with Warsaw weather, right? And we can define this constant Warsaw weather um, up top. It could be any temperature, any condition, and we are stubbing the call. And then in the build of the block test, it's responsible for just returning the qubit that's going to be tested or the block that's going to be tested. So in this case, we're just going to return that instance that was created earlier. And the rest of the test should be pretty straightforward, right? In the act, we can just call fetch weather with Warsaw. 
And then in the expect, we can expect that the qubit first emits a loading state followed by a success state with that constant weather that we stubbed earlier. And so uh, we basically checked all the boxes of making sure that the qubit is behaving as it should. We can take it one step further though and also verify that internally the qubit is doing what it's supposed to be doing um, by adding this verify step to our block test, which allows us to make sure that not only is it returning the correct states or emitting the correct states, but it's also calling the correct method on weather repository with the correct argument. And so this is an extra level of safety that you can add um, in your application because for whatever reason, if someone accidentally changed the internal implementation of the qubit to instead of use the city that's passed in to have some hard-coded city, this test would fail and you would catch that bug in the code and then you'd be able to fix it immediately before merging it. So that's an important um, kind of piece of functionality that you can add in to make your test even more safe. Um, to handle rainy day, let's say you want to handle an exception. We can define a generic exception. You can also have custom exceptions that your repository might throw and your qubit or block might react differently. But for simplicity, let's just assume it behaves the same for any exception. Uh, just like before, we can stub the repository anytime get weather is called. This time we can use the then throw instead of then answer, and we can pass that exception. And so now the rest of the test um, is very similar. We call fetch weather again with Warsaw, and now we would expect that instead of a success state after loading, we're going to have a failure state, right? Because the repository is going to throw this exception. And so you can get fancier here and have messages and enums representing the different reasons for failure, et cetera. Uh, but the setup of the test overall is pretty much going to stay the same and it's nice and consistent with the previous one as well. The only things that change are just the stubbing step and then the expectation, which is cool. Now you might be thinking, okay, like I've seen unit tests plenty of times. Unit tests are generally pretty easy. What about the widget test? Because kind of that's like the part that the user cares about. Um, that's the part that the user is interacting with. I want to make sure my widgets are behaving properly. And so similar to the unit test, we'll have the setup um, step in our widget tests. And so again, now the dependencies are kind of different, right? With the um, weather qubit, the dependency was the weather repository. What, uh, whereas with the home view, the dependency is the qubit itself. And so you'll notice like each layer only needs to care about its immediate dependencies and it does not need to know anything beyond that. Like the view does not know about the repository. The qubit does not know anything beyond the repository, no database knowledge, no API knowledge, nothing. And so having that separation and that layering is super useful in making um, your app easy to test and also easy to maintain over time. And so, yeah, the, the view depends on the qubit. So similar to the repository would we'll define a mock weather qubit. This is using the mock block uh, class instead of mockito. And this comes from that block test package that I showed. Um, and everything else is the same. We define the weather qubit. We create a new mock instance every single time uh, before each test. And then now we can use when to stub the state of the qubit. So whenever anyone queries the state of the qubit, we can have full control over what the state is. So we can say, I want in this case, the qubit state to be the initial state. Um, I can then use the tester.pump widget API to render a home view, which is the widget that we'll be testing. But I'm gonna wrap it in a block provider with the mock weather qubit in this case. And so now you kind of have full control over what the home view is reacting to. It's reacting to our own weather qubit that we've kind of stuck in the middle there. And uh, all of the state changes and things are in our work, we're under the control of the state changes there. So like we're in full control over how that widget should behave. And so then we can easily just use a find by type or find by key or whatever finder um, you want in, in your particular case to basically make sure that the UI responds correctly. So in this case, a simple one is just find by type that the widget, that weather empty widget is there. Um, for the loading case, it's very similar. We just change the stubbing line to return a loading state and we expect the weather loading widget to be there. The success state, a little more exciting, but still you've probably seen like 99% of this code. We have our uh, famous Warsaw weather object. This time it's sunny and 20.1 degrees and the stubbing um, step will just basically stub a weather success with that Warsaw weather object and we can expect to find that weather populated widget and the failure case we can just stub a failure and then find the weather error widget, right? So very simple. All these tests are about the same in terms of uh, lines of code. They're about the same in terms of steps. So we have the stubbing step, we have the actual pumping of the widget or like setting up the UI, and then we have the expectation last. And it's always this like same prescriptive 
um, exercise that once you get in the hang of it, it doesn't really, it kind of just becomes part of the process. And I feel like I never really think about like, oh, hey, I'm writing tests now. It's just become part of how I write code. And it also gives me that like great feeling that, hey, I'm super confident now that my qubit is going to behave the way I, I expect. And hey, my home view is going to also behave the way I expect. So now there's a couple of other scenarios that you might be interested in testing. Like, for example, if I have a different part of my widget tree with a search view, for example, and some sort of button that the user can tap on that will notify the qubit that, hey, I should fetch weather for a city. Right. And this doesn't have to be hard coded for simplicity. It is, but it could be coming from a text editing controller or something else. Um, but yeah, in general, how do I test these interactions? And the answer is the same as before, right? So uh, we stub the state, whatever state we want. In this case, it doesn't really matter because that widget doesn't have a dependency on the state, at least from the code that I've shown. Um, but the important part is this pump widget. Now we're basically wrapping a search view in our mock qubit. And then we can tap on the widget so we can interact with the UI that we care about. And then we can verify that the API um, or that the method that we want was called as many times as we expect it to be called. And so very similar for testing interactions. And um, those are kind of like most of the times or most of the scenarios that you want to test. There's one other common one, which is side effects. Like if I have yet another view called details view, and in here we have this block listener widget, which is kind of just doing non UI rendering things. Like in this case, showing a snack bar, if there is a failure, kind of like in the demo that happened earlier with the swipe to package, if instead of when you swipe, we show a snack bar, what if when the weather failed to load, we show a snack bar? How would you actually test this logic? And so this one um, involves this uh, function that comes from the block test package called when listen. And so now instead of stubbing with when from Makito, you can stub with when listen, pass the blocker qubit, and then the stream that you want to stub. And so now here, basically, we're saying anytime anyone subscribes to this weather qubit, this is the stream of states that they're going to receive. And what that allows us to do then is wrap that details view again with the block provider, pass that mock um, weather qubit. Now we pump for one frame so that we allow that snack bar to actually um, become visible. And then we can expect to find the snack bar is rendered. And so it's super important to uh, remember that when you're testing side effects um, that are triggered by block listener to use the when listen method from block test. Uh, whereas when you're testing block builder, just um, updates whenever the state changes, you can just use the basic when API from Makito. Um, and those will kind of take you pretty much most of the way. So hopefully that gives everyone a good sense of how to cut, kind of do most of unit tests, most of the cases with unit testing and uh, widget testing so that you can have the confidence that your app behaves as expected, both in terms of the qubit as well as in terms of the view. There's obviously way more um, testing resources out there. Your very own Rezo Coder has a uh, block test video that you can watch that I highly recommend where he also has a weather example that you can watch. Um, there's also another video by Wicked um, that's part of a larger series that covers testing. So I highly recommend if you're more visual and want to watch um, videos on this type of thing uh, with awesome animations and graphics and diagrams, definitely go check those out. I highly recommend them. Um, and so how are we doing on time? Let me quickly just escape. Okay, we're good. So. Um, the rest of the video uh, or the rest of the meetup, I'm going to talk about two more packages, Flutter block or uh, Hydrated block and Replay block. And so we'll start with Hydrated block, which probably a lot of you have heard of and maybe you've experimented with it. Basically, what it allows you to do is cache your state of your qubit and block automatically. So on every single state change, if you think about the weather example, anytime we emitted a new state, that would get cached. And then whenever that qubit or block was recreated, it would pick up where it left off. So if you think about with like a counter application, the basic counter that you get when you do a flutter create, when you increment that counter a couple of times and you get it to like 10 and you kill the app or you do a hot restart, it will start back at zero. And so if you were using hydrated block and managing that integer with a blocker qubit, it would actually remember where it left off. And then the next time it uh, was recreated, it would hydrate itself and pick up from where it left off so that the user experience was kind of like, oh, hey, you remembered where I was and it's a little more pleasant. Um, it's good for scenarios where you might have like, um, like a bad connection and you want to just show the user the old data that they had or um, if you want to have some sort of like offline functionality that's pretty basic you can get pretty far with just hydrated block and so you might be wondering like okay what's involved in doing that when you think caching you think like oh that might be pretty complicated I have to manage the storage and I have to manage uh, when to invalidate the cache and stuff like that 
Well, with hydrated block and hydrated qubit, the difference between the non-hydrated version and the hydrated version is just these two overrides. So um, the only thing that you really have to do is extend hydrated qubit instead of qubit, or if you're using block, hydrated block instead of block, and then you have to override to and from JSON. And so all of those methods are for, are basically at any point in time, um, the hydrated uh, superclass could be like, hey, give me the JSON for this state, and you have to implement that. So in this case, if we're managing the state as an integer, um, anytime it's like, hey, give me the state of um, this, or give me the JSON for this state, we can just return a JSON object where the key is counter and the state is the value of the counter, which starts at zero. And then same thing for the from JSON, given that map of string dynamic, how do we convert that back to a state? So we can just access that key and then cast it to an integer. There are more fancy things that you could do here, like you can use uh, code generation to generate the serialization and deserialization code. Um, but just for simplicity and to like make sure everyone understands the general concept, it's literally just converting to and from uh, or between state and a map. And that map is then stored locally and then re, um, refetched whenever the qubit or block is created. And then it's used to populate the state so that you can pick up where you left off and have that seamless experience. I'll show a demo of that in a second, but before that, I'll quickly talk about undo and redo uh, with replay block. So it's very new, it's still in 0.0.1 .0 dev. Um, there's a lot of functionality that I wanna add and I also would love any feedback that um, anyone has if you have a chance to play around with it. But the gist of it is basically they're, they're pretty, um, pretty like common cases where you wanna have something happen that a user can trigger, but be able to redo it and undo it. For example, if you think about that, like to-dos application that uh, is in Brian Egan's architecture samples, you can always delete a to-do and then immediately undo your delete if you changed your mind for whatever reason. And so implementing that undo redo functionality is something that um, you can actually kind of get for free using block um, by maintaining that history internally. And so like I mentioned, thanks to Rody we have this new package replay block. And the difference, unlike hydrated block and hydrated qubit, the difference between the two is literally just this one um, extends. Instead of extending qubit, we extend replay qubit. And then same thing for block. Instead of extending block, we extend replay block. And that's it. You don't have to do any additional work as a developer. And so I will show you now demo time. Um, if you want to check out the code now or later, it's at my GitHub, so GitHub slash full angel slash cool counter for lack of creativity or a better name. Um, and basically what I've done is I've taken that Flutter counter ap application and then I've applied, applied hydrated block and replay block on top of it. So you can basically be able to pick up where you left off when you're incrementing and also be able to undo and redo your increment and decrement um, actions. And so it's kind of a simple example, but it should give everyone a good sense of how to use it. And then you can extend it um, for your own use cases and definitely open issues or uh, feature requests if you think of anything or um, it's missing functionality that you'd like to see. So I'll quickly give a demo of the app. If you clone the repo and run it locally, um, basically it just looks like a counter. We can um, increment the counter, decrement the counter, and you'll notice as I'm changing, there are these arrows where I can start undoing, right? I can go all the way back and I can redo all my actions back to where I was last, um, where I last left off, right? And the other cool thing is I can basically hot restart and I will pick up where I left off. I don't know if you can even see that it's happening quickly, but um, yeah, I can hot restart and I don't lose the state that I left off at. And so the restart uh, caching is from hydrated, a block and hydrated qubit and then this undo redo functionality um, is coming from replay block and replay qubit. And so I'll quickly take the remaining 10 minutes ish and just walk you through some of the code and what it looks like. I've shown some of it on the slides, but um, let's take a look at the qubit. There's some things that I didn't show on the slides. So the first thing is um, we're extending hydrated qubit, like I mentioned, and overriding this to and from JSON. That's nothing new, but now a lot of people might be confused at this point with like, how do I get the replay functionality on top of the hydrated functionality? And for that, there's a mixin. And so you can apply the hydrated um, qubit functionality as a mixin, and you can also apply the replay qubit functionality as a mixin so that you can layer them and you don't have to choose one or the other, you can have both. And everything else is pretty much just like 
standard methods exposed like increment decrement reset. Now in terms of the UI, um, the important things to note are in the main, I am ensuring that the widgets binding is initialized so that uh, we can set up the storage and this uses path provider. So that's why you need to ensure that your uh, widgets binding is initialized so that the plugin will work in your main before you call run app. So that's important that you don't forget this. And then by default, like I mentioned, you can just use the built-in hydrated storage, which uses Hive. Um, Hive key value storage is really fast. Uh, if you're interested in benchmarks and things, previously we were just using file storage to cache this. And if you look at some of the benchmarks, it's really crazy how much faster it is to use Hive. Um, so, but you can also implement your own hydrated storage. So if you want to use something like Sembast, or if you want to do something totally custom, you can also implement your own. You're not limited to just Hive. The rest of the app, um, it's pretty simple. We're wrapping a counter page in that counter qubit that is now a replay qubit as well as a hydrated qubit. And then the counter page um, has our app bar, has two actions. So these two actions are just icon buttons. And one of them is for undo and one of them is for redo. And when you tap on them, if you can undo or can redo, this is an API you get for free by um, extending replay qubit or replay block. Um, so if you're able to, then we'll execute that action. Otherwise, we'll say that those buttons don't do anything so that they look disabled in the UI and then the user knows they can't click on them. Um, for the body of the scaffold, we're just using a block builder to update the counter, nothing crazy there. And for the actual uh, floating action buttons, each of those is just uh, invoking the respective method on the qubit. And so, yeah, pretty much what you end up with is a simple counter, but you get some awesome functionality built on top with almost no additional code. And um, yeah, again, this is all on the GitHub uh, repo. So if you're interested, you can check out the cool counter, open a PR, uh, help me with the documentation. I can add some screenshots and stuff because it's kind of looking plain right now. But also all the slides that I went over are in this directory as well. So if you go in and look at the PDF, uh, you can relook at any of the slides if you just want to look at the code on your own machine. So yeah, that's kind of um, it for the live demo. Uh, additional resources on block are the blocklibrary.dev, which I'm currently working on revamping a lot of the tutorials. So um, hopefully within the next few weeks, there'll be way more tutorials besides just login and Firestore login that are like production quality examples that are fully tested. That's kind of the next goal right now is to just make sure that um, each of those examples is taking full advantage of block as well as qubit and has um, complete test coverage and shows you kind of a more representative example of what an app might look like if it was like a production quality app. Um, you can also join the Discord server if you have any questions. There's always someone around to answer them. And also if you have any showcase examples that you've built using block or qubit, people always love to share those. So yeah, definitely don't hesitate to join um, and chat with the community. And uh, yeah, that's all I got. Thanks so much for having me. Hopefully everyone learned something new. Uh, and um, yeah, keep in touch and I will turn it back to Mateusz.